Now, as we start to see this major vein here, we have the subclavian vein medial to the first rib, which then crosses the border of the first rib to become the axillary vein, and the superficial vein joining into it is this cephalic vein right here. We want to maintain that one because as we pan down across the arm, you can see that this is maintaining a lateral position. Now, on the medial aspect, you can see how the basilic is diving deep into the brachial veins, so the veins are starting to be um, duplicated. Then there's a superficial branch that will come out at the cubital fossa, where they'll run just superior to the bicipital aponeurosis and be protected from all of those needle punctures that will be happening clinically. Here you can see a median cephalic vein running down the forearm, the lateral cephalic joining out to the cephalic vein itself. In the forearm we'll have a lateral set of vessels, which would be the cephalic system, and again, the medial side would be the basilic system. The way I remember is C for thumb, because you can't make cephalic without using your thumb. Those are lateral, just like your thumb is the lateral digit. Now we'll pen back up, and we'll start to reflect the pectoralis major. Mr. Big Hands, thank you very much. There we can see pectoralis minor, reflect that up. And here you can see all of the axillary veins. Now there can be a lot of veins, it's a very large vein, and they start to duplicate as you get into the limbs, but here you can see a valve for dilation from the injection. Now we're gonna swing over to the opposite side, and we're gonna start to see where that's been reflected out of the way. So the axillary sheath is composed of, we have our axillary artery, our axillary vein, and the components of the brachial plexus, all enclosed within that axillary sheath, which will then push out from the axilla. After it crosses the inferior edge of the teres major muscle, it will then become brachial. So our axilla runs from the first rib down to the bottom of teres major. It's a very small area. Now let's zoom in a little bit more on this shot. And we'll have Mr. Big Hands find the axillary vein, which has been pulled out of the way. And reflect it up. There we go. Now we can see here the axillary artery coming down and across all the way out until it becomes the brachial artery. It's getting covered by some of the nerves, which will have important relationships. The axillary artery can be broken down into three components, and the major Division of those three components is the landmark pectoralis minor. Mr. Big Hands, can we put that into play? There's the pectoralis minor. And if you look at the medial components of it, you can see in this portion medial to it is part one. Then we have behind it and lateral to it, which would be part two on either side. And then as you get to the lateral component of that muscle down until teres major, you have part three. Part one typically has one branch off of it, and this one's a little bit variable, but up high up in the neck, we can see that superior thoracic branch. Mr. Big Hands will have to get a hold of that one. There it is. Right there, superior thoracic branch. Spend a little less time finding that one. It's oftentimes very small. The only reason it was easy to find in this particular specimen is that this is actually giving off the lateral thoracic branch up high, which will supply serratus anterior. As we go out a little bit more lateral on this, we'll stay zoomed in, we'll just pan laterally. Now we can see one branch coming up, which would be the th uh, thoracoacromial trunk. Now we can see the thoracoacromial trunk right there, and it has multiple branches coming off of it. Typically we'll have four branches coming off of it. Two are to bones of the region, and two are to muscles of the region. What are the muscles of the region? Deltoid and pectoralis branches. So there are deltoid and pectoral branches. The other things that are coming off in this region, the two major bones, axilla, or the uh, clavicle, and we're also having the scapula. So the highest point of the shoulder is the acromion, so there will be an acromial branch as well as a clavicular branch. 
Now we have one small little teeny branch coming off here, which is off part two, and this little branch right there is actually the more typical location for that downward heading branch called the lateral thoracic. And remember, the lateral thoracic artery runs on serratus anterior to supply its vascular needs, along with the long thoracic nerve. It's important not to get those two mixed up. There's the long thoracic nerve, C5, 6, and 7. And the lateral thoracic artery, the way you can remember it is that long has an N in it for nerve, and lateral thoracic has an A in it for artery. Now as we move lateral, to the pectoralis minor, we run into part three of the axillary artery. Just for orientation, we have the shoulder out here. We have the pectoral muscles reflected upwards, and the clavicle's been cut away, so we see the axillary contents coming through here. We're going to look into this area by zooming in and pulling that brachial plexus forward. And then we're going to zoom right in there and grab it with the forceps, so we can see here, anterior humeral circumflex artery, and a little bit deeper down, the, and the larger of the two vessels typically is the posterior humeral circumflex vessel. Now we've switched to a camera that's giving us an under view. We can see that the axillary artery is right here, and we can see a very short subscapular branch that doc, uh, Dr. Dr. Big Hands, Mr. Big Hands is putting pressure, pressure upward on. And you can see two branches coming from it. This one, which would be the thoracodorsal, and this branch right here wrapping around through the triangular space, which would be the circumflex scapular. Now, we'll start to focus a little bit more on our brachial plexus by going first to our plastinated specimen. As we look here, we can see the vertebral bodies of this specimen. We can see all five branches of the roots that are coming off. Root one, one at the top is going to be C5, C6, 7, 8 with a rib, and then we can see T1 coming up underneath. Now we can see 5 and 6 come together for the superior or upper trunk. 7 is on its own for the middle trunk, and C8 and T1 are coming together as the lower trunk. After that, we can see the suprascapular nerve coming off at the upper trunk. Then it's going to come into this area, which would be the divisions, and there will be anterior divisions right here, and posterior divisions coming off at this area. Now we're going to pan across that brachial plexus a little bit. Here we can see some more complications of the divisions occurring in this area and the axillary artery would be coming right across in here, and we'd now start to see the lateral cord, medial cord, and this large posterior cord in behind. Before we go to the five terminal branches, let's focus a little bit on what's happening to the cords. The lateral cord has two things you want to remember. The posterior cord has three things you want to remember, and the medial cord has four things that you want to remember. Let's go back to our specimen and take a look at the contributors to those particular chords. First, we'll look at the M structure to orient ourselves. We have three of our five terminal branches making up the M structure. Those are, first we find the musculocutaneous. That will lead us to the coracobrachialis muscle, then back up until we hit the junction with another nerve which then leads you down into the median, which then you can follow up again until you hit another junction, and leads you down into the ulnar. So we have musculocutaneous, median, and ulnar. As you follow those up, you can see here the axillary artery in play, and now we have our lateral cord, lateral to that artery, our medial cord, medial to that artery. If you're thinking about the divisions coming out of the neck, they come out this way, go back into anatomical position. Anything that's from the top of the plexus is more laterally oriented. Anything from the bottom of the plexus is more medially oriented, and that's what happens with the cords. Two things, remember, that you wanted to see coming off of the lateral cord. There is the lateral pectoral nerves. You can see them coming up into pec minor, right there, right in this area. And you can also see the contribution to the median nerve right here. So this is the lateral cord's contribution to median nerve. And then we have the terminal branch, the musculocutaneous, which we already discussed. 
three things are coming off of the posterior cord, which to see you need to pull the artery and the nerves up and out of the way. There we go. And if we zoom into this area right here, we should be able to see all three branches. Here, coming into the subscapularis muscle, we can see the upper subscapular nerve. Here, we can see the middle subscapular nerve, which is going to run towards the um, latissimus dorsi, so it's also known as the thoracodorsal. And then here, we can see the lower subscapular nerve, which will supply subscapularis, as well as teres major. Now we'll look at the third cord, which is the medial cord, which has four things you want to remember coming off of it. Not only can you see the medial pectoral nerves crossing over right here, that's one. We also have a medial contribution to the median nerve, that's two. And then we have two cutaneous branches. One is seen coming off of this cord at this point where you can see the medial brachial cutaneous going to the skin of the arm as well as the medial antibrachial cutaneous going to the skin of the forearm. How do you tell those two apart? The medial brachial cutaneous goes to the skin in the upper arm and is usually cut whereas the branches of the medial antibrachial cutaneous will travel all the way to the elbow before they start branching. So you'll see it in the brachial sheath. You need to follow that one a little bit to identify it. Now let's look finally at the last terminal branches. We'll go back to our M again. We can find our musculocutaneous, median, and ulnar branches. If we pull those up and out of the way, there behind, right in here, we can see we got a hand in there. We can see right here, pan down slightly. There's our posterior cord giving off two branches, the axillary that's disappearing into the quadrangular space, and the radial, which is the largest of the two, which will continue all the way down through the triangular interval as it gets into the posterior compartment of the arm, or brachium. Let's look at the branches and the cords one more time from this different view. First of all, we have the lateral cord, and we have the medial cord. Here, you can see our M with our musculocutaneous coming down into a median, which then comes back up, and then into an ulnar. Notice how the ulnar is really closely opposed to this guy right here, which is the medial antibrachiocutaneous nerve the brachial cutaneous has been dissected away. If we pull that median out of the way, you can also see the axillary artery. Median nerve. And right there, there's that nice axillary artery. Two more branches to see off the posterior cord. And to see the posterior cord, we're thinking up here. We have to pull everything up. There's our axillary artery. Now way up high, right here, we've got the posterior cord which is going to divide down into the branches, which are going to be the uh, axillary. Mr. Big Hands has that. And then the one that would continue out into the posterior arm, the radial. We can even see off the posterior cord this middle subscapular or thoracodorsal coming off of the cord itself. Not a terminal branch, but a cord branch. Well, that's it for our brachial plexus and axilla removal. Uh, review. I hope you've had fun in the armpit with me. I'm the anatomy guy and we'll see you in the next episode.